Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Alexis Badenmayer. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association. And today I am joined by the Midwest Healthy Ag Team. Ann Wolf serves as the co-director for Midwest Healthy Ag. She has a master's degree in philanthropy and nonprofit development and owns and manages a 300 acre farm in Iowa. Rob Wallace is an evolutionary epidemiologist and co-director for research at Midwest Healthy Ag. Luis Fernando Chavez is a disease ecologist and works with the Gorgas Memorial Health Research Institute in Panama. Luke Bergman is a geographer and associate professor at the University of British Columbia. And today we are discussing a new publication from the Midwest Healthy Ag Team. It's published in The Land, and it is called Mapping Agricultural Lands from Conventional to Regenerative. So we're going to have a roundtable discussion about this new paper. Um, I'll let Rob introduce the, the whole project and Anne as well, because they're the directors of the project, and then Luke and Louise are the researchers. So we'll let Rob and Anne tell us how this what was the, the seed of this paper? Uh, sure, if it's all right, Anne, I'll, I'll begin uh, if it's okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's just say that Midwest Healthy Ag is a, is a research program that was put together by Regeneration Midwest and the Agroecology and Rural Economics Research Corps. Uh, Regeneration Midwest is a group of farmers and food activists interested in uh, moving uh, Midwest agriculture in more of a regenerative direction uh, the Agroecology Rural Economics Research Corps is a group of independent scientists who are interested in helping out farmers and other community groups on their research needs. And so a couple of years ago, we applied for a grant uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to uh, look at how agriculture impacts uh, population health and uh, climate change. And so we set up a study, uh, it's a, what's called a multi-level study. We're, we're looking at this uh, issue at uh, two different levels. Uh, the first level is to look at uh, how agriculture is distributed across the Midwest. And that seems like an obvious thing, but uh, it's not necessarily something that's been really done, particularly at the county level. There are 1,055 uh, Midwest counties. And so there's a lot of work to be done in terms of figuring out uh, what kind of agriculture is being uh, pursued where. Uh, the second level of the study involves uh, you know, picking a couple counties uh, for six uh, Midwest states. Uh, and the states we ended up choosing are uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, uh, uh, Illinois, Kansas, um, Nebraska, and uh, I, is that six there? I can't remember if I counted all right. Um, but we want wanted to choose two counties uh, in each of those uh, states um, and interview farmers there. And the two counties would be one county more on the kind of conventional end of production and one county more in regenerative end of the production. And we ended up uh, over the last two years uh, interviewing 96 farmers and uh, following up with focus groups uh, across uh, the communities, including uh, religious leaders, including uh, uh, women uh, farmers, including BIPOC farmers, so to get a complete picture of how uh, agriculture might be impacting uh, health and climate change. And so this land paper uh, is, is specifically about um, uh, that first level. Uh, how is agriculture distributed across the Midwest? Anne? I would say, Rob, that sums it up quite well. Um, and I think when we have the opportunity to pull in Luis and, and Luke in, uh, in how they structured and went about the information that they gathered to put in the land paper, that in, it, in and of itself, the met methodology and the process itself is extremely fascinating um, and very in-depth um, and was a wealth of information that we could you know, drop into the land paper uh, to support uh, the findings that we have so far in our what we are calling our phase one uh, concept for this particular program, a grant funded program. All right, let's hear from Luke and Louise then. Um, I'll have each one of you tell the audience, um, I guess the most surprising finding, what you did not anticipate, um, something that you think is unique to your findings in your research. Luke, do you wanna start? Sure, thank you. 
it's just a pleasure to be with you here today. I suppose that the thing that I was um, hoping to find or wasn't sure whether we would find or not, but was gratified to see that it did come out at the end of the analysis was that there really is a diversity of agricultural practice and agricultural systems throughout this larger uh, Midwest. So we tried to pick measures to characterize the landscape, measures that would make sense in a variety of different parts of the Midwest. Uh, so we tried to create a, 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 an index that would work for everywhere. But at the same time, we were hoping that that index would differentiate places and let us see a bit of the character of the Great Plains versus the woodlands versus the, um, the, the, the Great Lakes sorts of regions. And indeed, that's what happened. We found that as we constructed a way of understanding these different uh, counties and their agricultural practices quantitatively by combining all sorts of, of different ways of, of quantifying agriculture, we found that different regions had different characters to them and that we could begin to describe those. And it's not a simple story of one part of the Midwest being far more regenerative than others. There are regenerative regions, regions that that whose agricultural have interesting agricultural practices have really interesting forms of um, regenerative um, character that that are throughout the Midwest. And so finding all of those different uh, different regions that perhaps people could learn from uh, as they're seeking to shift their own practices, things that are closer to home um, was was really gratifying. So we and we also displayed this graphically in a series of maps that you all might find interesting uh, if you have a chance to to take a look. Very cool. I will look for those maps. I'll try to try to get them up on my screen in a moment. But I have a follow up question based on what you said, Luke, um, and it can go to any of the panelists. Um, in the Obama administration, oh, here we go. Thank you, Corey. Corey Melby is working behind the scenes to, to make this all good. And so, so here's, yeah. So actually, why don't we have, before I get to my questions, since we've just put the map up, Luis, tell us what we're looking at. We have to unmute, unmute yeah. Luis. Yeah, okay, sorry. there we go. Okay. So here what we see is the index uh, map and basically we have a color scale and then the darker we see is what we find or what we found as most regenerative counties. The uh, lighter colors represents uh, counties that are more into the conventional agriculture and then uh, it's just as a simple way like to see uh, the things, no? Like for example, if we see most of Northern Michigan is into the regenerative, actually most of Michigan is, but for example, if we go to Kansas down there, uh, we see it's more into the conventional agriculture. So this is a first snapshot, but as Luke said, the, the history gets more complicated, no? Because we have different kinds of regenerative, different kinds of of conventional and that's presented in some other uh, maps also in the paper and on the accompanying website where the uh, maps are available for people to download and to play with them. Great, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. So um, so these, the pale colors, the, the light greens that are sort of in between the dark green and the white, that's where we see a, a huge diversity of types of farms. And so I want to ask you all about that. Um, in the Obama administration, there were huge controversies over GMOs, the impact that GMOs would have on organic. Now, I'm sure that's still a controversy today, but the administration actually said that they wanted to deal with that at the time. And uh, Secretary Vilsack, who is again secretary now under the Biden administration, Secretary Tom Vilsack. Um, used the word coexistence. He said that we, he wanted to foster coexistence between conventional agriculture and organic agriculture. And, and of course, this is 
challenging for organic farms who deal with pesticide drift, who deal with pollution of, of water resources from factory farms that deal with genetic drift of GMOs. So, so how does your, so I'm, I'm not gonna ask you to weigh in with your opinions on those things. I've certainly got my own strong opinions. We may get opinions from folks who are watching, which I would definitely like to hear from. Um, but just in terms of, of what you're seeing, are, are organic and GMO pesticide free and pesticide using um, you know, factory farms that have all of their animals indoors and, and farms that are using grazing? You know, are we seeing this mixed up? And what does, what does your research tell us about coexistence in agriculture, the challenges or, or places where it's not such of a challenge, so much of a challenge? Well, if you, if you like, if it's okay if I start here, just to say that, um, uh, I mean, we have strong opinions about this as, as well, all this as well, uh, but to say that, uh, you know, if we are in the business of trying to move an entire region in which some of the states are larger than whole countries elsewhere, and we have to take a, a really broad 30,000 foot view of uh, how to go about making this shift. Uh, you know, as we all know, uh, the Midwest is very much a center of, of industrial agriculture, uh, exporting food uh, around the world, often to the great damage to uh, many counties. A lot of, uh, oh, as you brought up, pesticide drift, uh, uh, water contamination, destruction of soils. And so in part, that's why uh, the general move toward regenerative production would be, in our view, the way to go. However, uh, it's, uh, as you brought up, there's a com all these complexities involved um, uh, in that, um, we, uh, you, know, you can find uh, so-called conventional counties in which uh, uh, farmers are very interested in, in engaging in kind of minimalist regenerative practices, uh, you know, starting off with cover crops and uh, uh, things that uh, would in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, low tillage, uh, you know, as a way of beginning to protect the soils in a, in a way that uh, allows for a, a move toward a direction of, of better practices that would hopefully um, reduce the number, the amount of soil that's destroyed. Uh, on the other hand, we have in uh, regenerative counties, uh, people who do use pesticides. Uh, and when we speak about regenerative county or conventional county, it doesn't mean that everybody in that county does conventional practices or everybody in that county does, um, uh, does uh, 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 in a conventional county does conventional uh, practices. So there's all sorts of combinations going on. Uh, whole areas are very complex. Even small counties can be uh, sites of very complex um, uh, agroecologies in which uh, people are making all sorts of decisions based on their connection to the land or also their connection to their pocketbook, you know, how to pay, uh, you know, their mortgage payments in the next season. Uh, so these things, these issues are very complex. And so over the course of doing this research, we've kind of uh, moved in the direction of that uh, these kinds of conversations need to be had across both uh, regenerative farmers and conventional uh, farmers in a way that uh, things are a lot more complex. It's not in these two bins of, you know, uh, everybody uh, does regenerative practices. Uh, and there's all sorts of kind of regenerative practices. Uh, you know, there's the minimalist ones I talked about, uh, you know, low tillage and cover crops, but there are also um, uh, other practices in, in our view of regenerative ag, uh, and we try to include in this index, uh, ex uh, extends to how uh, farmers are pro uh, producing foods as far as uh, the relationship to the greater community. Are they producing foods that are consumed uh, locally? Are they uh, producing food for export? And so there is what we term a kind of a maximalist regenerative practice, meaning a kind of high-end regenerative practice in which uh, uh, some farmers are, in, are engaged in kind of full regenerative uh, 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 practice of um, not only treating the land well uh, and, but, and producing nutritious food, but also selling their goods in local areas. So the question you brought up is, is fun, fundamental toward any efforts toward moving us uh, in a direction in which... Um, uh, we, uh, we can uh, have the Midwest uh, on a more healthy uh, agriculture that uh, 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 is able to feed uh, the region and also do so in a way that can uh, uh, allow us to reproduce, socially reproduce and produce food on a, in, in, within the next gen few generations uh, rather than uh, producing food in a way that uh, strips the land of its uh, capacity to uh, reproduce and produce food. Great, thank you, Rob. 
Um, Luke, do you want to weigh in on the coexistence issue? Sure. Sure. Um, we have some empirical results here uh, on the map, too, that show regions where you have both more regenerative farming alongside more conventional farming. So we divided the, sorry, getting a little echo there. All right, back, great. We divided the landscape up using some quantitative techniques to try to figure out which counties were more like which other counties in terms of the types of uh, agricultural practices that they that they carried out. And we found that in, in this map you're looking at here, each of the different colors, um, things that are, counties that are colored the same way are more similar to each other than they are to the uh, other counties that are colored differently. Uh, so we found that there are some regions that have a bit more of this coexistence that you're talking about and other regions that are uh, characterized by more either regenerative farming or more conventional farming. So uh, for example, the pink region in the map you're looking at right there, the area in between the uh, Missouri River and then the, the, the Red River, say, up between uh, Minnesota and North Dakota, that pink region, that region has uh, th there are a number of farms in that region that are applying a variety of pesticides, but at the same time, there's a lot of other farms in that region that are uh, that are relatively regenerative, or perhaps even sometimes that's the same farm. We can't say from our from our data at this level of the study. That would have to be the other study that Rob was talking about, the other level of the study where people go in and talk with farmers, um, or you know. We have farmers on the team, so uh, you know. Uh, uh, but this this level is not is is not that analysis. So places like the pink the pink region have more of that coexistence going on. There's other regions like the um, the uh, sorry the the gray the 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 gray area where there is um, actually sorry. Let me say the blue the blue region has a lot more um, conventional work and a lot of the blues covered by the other half of that, uh, the other graph down there at the, below. But you can see it in some of the, you can see it in the Missouri River Valley up um, up in North Dakota. And you can also see it, it's uh, parts of parts of the high plains in, 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 Can in Kansas and Nebraska have a good deal of the blue region. And the blue region is much more of uh, what we identified at least to be a, a conventional sort of agricultural region. But there are, uh, you know, there are pockets within each of these that operate differently. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we offer a variety of different ways of looking at this. And some of them match up with the others, and some of them just characterize a bit of the diversity and complexity to the story that is, that's available. So um, the other point about coexistence is, we're looking at the whole Midwest, and so yes, you can have pollen drift uh, a good, a good ways. But um, you know, our our, our uh, if if we're showing you a county by county, uh, county by county analysis is is uh, you know you can have a fairly regenerative county right next to a fairly conventional county, and is that coexistence or is that? Um, is that separation? It's kind of a question of what scale you're looking at, and we were we were looking at the county and a, and and broader scale here. So thank you, on to Rob. Or another question, my bad. And Louise and Anne, how about Louise? Yeah, would you like to weigh in on what your study tells us about how farmers are coexisting the organic to conventional range, and and how well farmers are situated to be able to maximize their production. Well, just as Luke mentioned, and, and I mean, as, a, as it was the idea of this second map, no, you have different kinds of regenerative and different kinds of conventional. No, what's specific to each kind varies from region to region. And then again, like uh, the other big point about the methodology of making the maps is like, it doesn't necessarily need to be like GMOs or, or specific pesticides, no? It's like the full model, no? Like either using a GMO or using a pesticide, 
uh, ends up being a conventional practice, no? And that has, uh, that's tied to a lot of other things that make a difference for the living of the farmer and actually also for the health of the community living next to the farm, for the people that eat whatever is produced in the farm. And, and again, in that sense, I think when, when we did the research, we were very careful to consider all of this when producing that map, when getting that scale and the scales that you saw both in the first map and the different clusters that Luke was going into detail, no? Uh, I think uh, it's interesting uh, or one of the problems, or I mean, there might be some pro problems with this idea of coexistence, but again, so those are things that probably are not so expressing the map. That's the other part of the research that we want to do. and. And I don't know, probably Rob is a person, Rob and Anna are the best equipped to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, just briefly to say that, um, you know, we take the view that all farmers are are, are doing important work uh, and where, wherever they are on that uh, uh, scale there. And our project's about listening and learning from farmers. That's the interview uh, end of, of our, our project. Um, but it's uh, important to try to encourage uh, farmers wherever they are on that continuum to move in the direction of more regenerative practices. Uh, it's uh, wonderful that conventional farmers are doing the kind of minimalist uh, regenerative stuff to start off with. Um, but in, in the end, of course, we think that that's not enough. Uh, we're not interested, at least my personal view is I don't think regenerative ag should be about uh, merely serving as kind of greenwashing for agribusiness. I do think there has to be much more of a notion of, of locus of control, meaning that local communities uh, make the decisions about what happens in terms of their farms and more broadly across the, the uh, farming landscape. You know, uh, farming isn't just about what you do from uh, uh, your farm gate. Uh, to your barn. It's very much about the, the broader uh, ecological landscape. Uh, is there clean water running through your land? Is there um, is the soil uh, healthy beyond uh, merely the, the farm gate? And all these things are something that is, requires the community to intervene. And uh, the agribusiness model, in, in my view, uh, largely kind of separates farmers out and uh, cuts them up into individuals in a way that uh, to the detriment of communities. And so whatever community, I mean, we, we've come across counties that are, are more conventional, but they're organized. And so, you know, you have farmers in con so-called conventional counties who are doing conventional production and are starting to do more regenerative practices in part because uh, they are, are linking up with uh, uh, community members who are concerned about the health of their local rivers. And so this is the kind of thing in, in a time in which uh, there's, uh, you know, terrible things happening in terms of climate change, in terms of the, the amount of uh, uh, soil uh, fertility, in terms of the, amount, the water table across the Midwest. Uh, it, there are some uh, remarkable bright spots in terms of uh, uh, consciousness across communities in terms of uh, moving in more of regenerative direction. So that's just why we've taken a, a much broader view about uh, what counts as, as a, a good trajectories. And so if there are commu uh, regenerative communities uh, and counties that are, you know, going full bore in terms of local sales and CSAs, that's absolutely wonderful. But we also think it's a good sign when a conventional uh, community, uh, conventional, uh, so-called conventional counties are, are starting to move in more of a regenerative direction, too. And that, that should be supported and, and encouraged. Definitely. I'm going to take a question from the audience from Natalie Duncan. But before I do that, Anne, do you have anything that you want to say on the issue of, of coexistence and, and how your mapping might help farmers figure out, you know, what is going to be most profitable and successful in their region, given the character of the area? Well, in all, in all honesty, I can safely feel like I can only speak for myself as a farmer and a, a farm land owner. Um, and as Rob mentioned, there's, um, you know, every farm is unique and different. And a lot of it has to do with the geography of what you are capable of farming on that land, mm -hmm. uh, what your interests might be uh, as far as a commodity, whether it's cattle, sheep, poultry, whatever it might be, um, you know, pigs, whatever your interest is. Um, 
And, you know, around my farm location, way over there in eastern Iowa, uh, farms around my farm, they're, they're just as varied as, as my farm is. And everyone has their, you know, different perspective of what they want to do. It depends on how much land they own. Uh, most of the farms and the farm owners, at least, you know, again, around my farm, uh, have a full time job off the farm. And even, you know, if they're farming eight, nine hundred acres, uh, they're still working full time off the farm somewhere just just to make ends meet. Um, farming, unless you have at least a, a thousand acres or higher, um, isn't profitable really by itself without you know, some type of government subsidy or, um, you know, whatever you might need. And and all the farmers, I mean, we always look at the bottom line. You know, there's bills to pay, there's taxes to pay. Um, and whatever we do uh, in whatever capacity we want to do with our farm, um, you know, we do have to watch that bottom line very carefully. I see a lot of conventional farmers doing regenerative practices. And just like Rob said, and, you um, you know, regenerative farms doing some conventional practices. So it, it's it's all across the board. Um, and I think what was fascinating for me, although I've been doing agriculture for many, many, many years, was to do was to be a part of this study, just to kind of listen to other farmers and hear their stories and what they were doing, and and obviously read the read the volume of information we had in the interviews, and um, it kind of supports some of my thinking. Um, in what I want to do with my farm and how I want it to operate um, and what I value. Again, I have a lot of uh, uh, conservation practices on my farm just because of where my farm is located. And, you know, there's always a story that goes along with that. But um, it, it's fascinating to hear the stories from other farmers and other practices. And, and again, it's just a very, extremely varied landscape. And agriculture in and of itself is extremely complicated and very fast moving. It's never really the same day twice. Great. Well, I'd like to start with Louise now on, on answering this question from Natalie Duncan. She says, well, could we, if, and Corey, if you could bring up the map again. And, and let's go through all of these, what the colors mean. And so Natalie asks, I see my country, my, sorry, my county is red, but, but what does that mean? So if you could show us the map and, and explain. So we've talked about the, the pesticide heavy region in pink, right? And then um, Luke was going to tell us, actually just pick up where, <laughs> where Luke left off, off Louise. I think you'll have to unmute, or Corey, you can unmute. I actually, I actually do have an issue that I'm colorblind, so I'm yeah. not <laughs> so sure about what's the red. Uh, so I defer to Luke. But I, I assume it's the one in Nebraska, but I don't know. Luke, please take it. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, Go yeah, ahead, sorry about that. No worries. Um, well, I don't know exactly which county you live in. Uh, Natalie, but I would I would love to hear that in the chat, um, which state and county would be great. Uh, but I can tell you that what the red is on the map that you're looking at, and um, for reference, that's the cluster zero on the the uh, the color that corresponds to okay. the zero in the upper right hand of the um, upper right hand of the screen. So perhaps that helps a little, Luis. Sorry about that, but. Um, those numbers, they're just arbitrary. They don't mean that zero is better or worse than than three. It's just a just we didn't name them. So they just have numbers. Sorry about that. Um, the red, what that means is it's a, uh, you know, your county has more in common with other red counties, according to the things we looked at in 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 this in this study. So the kinds of things we looked at were, um, you know, on the the things that that our that our study came up with that we thought would be um, more associated with regenerative farming, and this is this is this is not as much me as it is the larger the larger team, which includes uh, food system experts, farmers, some academics, students. It's a variety of, of of stakeholders. But so the kinds of things we looked at that we thought would be uh, associated more with uh, regenerative farming were things like 
How many of the farms practice intensive grazing? How many of the farms are using silvopastoral practices? How about livestock diversity on the farm? How about conservation easements? How about use of cover crops? How about no-till? How about crop diversity within um, a single farm? Is the farm growing a variety of types of crops or more just one? And then uh, is the farm selling locally or is it is it only selling um, to great distant uh, to to uh, suppliers and intermediaries at greater distances. So those were all things that we thought of as being relatively associated with regenerative practices more or less. And um, they were also, as I mentioned before, those are things that many of them you can find echoes of in a variety of parts of the Midwest. So it's not as specific as some things that are really local and regional. So, um, and then on the other side, the things that we thought of as, as quite commonly associated with perhaps more conventional production were things like, well, how many uh, types of pesticides does the farm use? Uh, how, how is the uh, agricultural methane emissions in, in that area? How about the average farm size in the county? Those are, and uh, how far does food flow? Um, how far is it shipped? Um, and also things like PM 2.5, so some other air quality measures. Those were all things that we thought of as being a bit more associated with, uh, with conventional production, perhaps, um, at least certain types of values for those. So what red means is that in the combination of all of those possible ways of looking at your county, your county has more common in, in those respects that I just mentioned with other red counties than it does with um, perhaps a blue county or a yellow county uh, or a pink county or a purple county, which are all the different regions that are that are nearby the red region. So now, in particular, what does the red region have? Well, um, we talk about the the red region on an, in the paper on page thirteen, which I know <laughs> you don't want want to flip uh, and and read about right now, but. Um, the red region has really high average farm sizes and it has relatively low livestock diversity. And at the same time, it has really high rates of intensive grazing. So that's an, you know, that's a nice combination. It has uh, some direct sales, uh, but um, not, it, it varied a bunch across the red region. And um, there wasn't as much pesticide use in that, in, in your region. And, um, there was there was actually kind of several things going on in the red region in terms of crop diversity. Some farms had a lot of diversity of their crops, and then there were other farms which were not diverse in their cropping practices uh, or the types of crops they grew, at least, let's say. Um, so, you know, red was an interesting region and you can compare how it differed from yellow and, and pink if, if you'd like. Um, when you just, uh, you can dig in some of the other maps and um, some of the text we wrote, if you'd like. But I hope that speaks to a little bit of both about what your region might have and then also how the larger study operated as well. Yeah, if I may, you know, what's really wonderful hearing Anne and, and Luke in terms of uh, the description of what these maps can do is that, you know, we're big fans of like farm to, farmer to farmer learning. It's a big deal. We're, we're all about that. That's fantastic. And, and for us, this is an example of that kind of stuff done at, the, at a kind of a larger level across the region. Uh, you know, I think all the regenerative uh, uh, campaigns have been largely, you know, focused on really micro local areas, which is, of course, incredibly important work. And we very much support that. And but we want to think in terms of like more strategic practices of how do we change the Midwest in the in a in, in moving in, in the right direction, both regenerative uh, practitioners and conventional practitioners, both areas in which regenerative practices are, are localized and conventional uh, practices. How do we move the Midwest in, in a better direction? And these kind of maps kind of uh, get you thinking, well, what's going on in, in, in the different parts of the Midwest? Um, you know, what what is the, uh, uh, what is Ohio doing uh, that's more regenerative? And we can learn uh, stuff that's going on in other counties and other states. And uh, all the counties can serve for each other as uh, uh, models uh, from which we can draw uh, uh, you know, new practices and new ways of doing things. Some practices may not be appropriate uh, for some areas. And, you know, if you're, if you're, um, 
you know, more in the in the kind of Great Plains areas. Uh, maybe there's not a lot of room to do silvopasture, um, but you, we can learn uh, stuff from what's going on in different parts of the region. And, and these maps are a good uh, entryway. And and we we don't claim that this is the final answer to things. And as uh, Luke described, the variables we chose to put in our index, another group might go, we want to choose different variables. And in fact, our group uh, ourselves are thinking about if we were to do this again, how would we do this differently? And so this is just really a doorway into uh, exercising our imaginations in terms of uh, how we can move counties in, in new directions and how we can move uh, whole parts of the Midwest in different directions. And so it provides a, a way in which we can uh, uh, go about doing this. Now, uh, Corey brought up this next map, this set of maps here, and these are our variables uh, across the Nebraska. And uh, you can see uh, the uh, livestock diversity on, on the upper left there. We have silver pasture and the one over and so on and so forth. And we can see the different uh, counties there have different combinations of these variables in a way that makes things very uh, uh, complex, uh, but at the same time illuminating in terms of thinking through how the counties actually differ from each other. And so, uh, you know, for uh, instance, I mean, I can't read the, the counties here from uh, uh, these maps, but we can see it's uh, intensive grazing there uh, is very high and the uh, northern and uh, central parts of uh, counties in Nebraska, but they have very low uh, levels of, of uh, no-till. And uh, overall, Nebraska doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, local direct sales. It might mean that that state is uh, largely directed toward export, uh, um, ex an export economy, and there's a lot of room to grow, so to speak, for uh, uh, counties, both conventional and regenerative, to move in the uh, direction of more local sales and CSAs and selling to local restaurants and such. Uh, so there's room for all sorts of conversations, and we're just opening the door for those. We don't have the, all the answers. We're interested in talking to people locally uh, in our interviews. Uh, and as Anne, Anne brought up, uh, these maps can serve as a way to to have start to have those kind of conversations and pick up on what other uh, parts of the uh, uh, region are, are are doing, and to begin to have that kind of more uh, integrated conversation among uh, farmers and food activists about uh, what way the Midwest can go. Because frankly, right now, largely the the story of food has been, in my view, in the hand of the large agribusinesses in the last few decades. And it's time, particularly uh, how that's not worked out very well, it's time that other people begin to get in a position to be able to uh, tell that tale. Yeah. Well, I'd like to take another question from the audience. Mirella Baez asks, when I, get, when I go get my produce and ask if it is organic, they say it is grown with no pesticides. Is that enough or should I make sure it's organic? And I want to tell a story from my own life about this. I, I was avoiding the farmer who came to my neighborhood uh, because he, he, he didn't say he was organic. He said he was pesticide free or he would have signs up about pesticide free. And so I would go to the next neighborhood over to their market because they had certified organic farmers and I could see the USDA seal on their stands. And then I got to know the farmer who lived closest to me really well. He's a good friend of mine now. And, and he said, oh, I just hated using the word organic because I thought it was so bougie and, and elitist. And I thought that, you know, there are a lot of low income people in the neighborhood. And I didn't want to, to make anybody feel like they didn't belong just because it was organic. And, and so I totally read him wrong, you know? And so I think the answer is obviously it depends, but you all probably have data that you can tell us, like how many farmers are there in this region? You know, you don't have to go with an exact number, but are you seeing most farmers who don't use pesticides getting certified organic? Or are you seeing a lot of farmers who are not certified, but don't use pesticides? Actually, the, the quick, there is a quick answer for that. And there are plenty of what we can call organic farmers that don't get certified. And part of the reason, I mean, some of it is what you mentioned, like, well, they don't see any benefit and it might be exclusionary, have all this problem with the community around them. There are other people that just simply don't trust the system that's behind the certification. And, and again, thinking in terms of the regenerative and conventional spectrum that we were studying, 
actually having no pesticides is a very good sign. Uh, that's something that definitely it's a plus, no? All right, let's keep taking questions because we've got a lot and they're really good. So from Sean, he asks, you talked about plant exudates being the main channel for the transfer of carbon compounds to the soil. One of the things we are told in regenerative agriculture is that you must integrate livestock and manure. Can you do that without livestock and increase soil carbon? Are the plant exudates enough or do you have to have the livestock component? Dr. Christine Jones says, no, the plant exudates are enough. We are seeing huge improvements in soil with companion planting and multi-species um, situations. So this kind of, if I'm reading Sean right, it, this kind of goes to this question of like, it, can you have veganic agriculture or is all agriculture really like that's organic? Is it actually incor incorporating animals as a source of fertility? Um, but again, I won't ask you to state your opinions on this. Tell us from your research, are, are you seeing, are there a lot of farms in the region that are not using animals, but are exemplary in terms of regeneration and organic? And if they aren't using animals for fertility, where is their fertility coming from? I would say that our study does not uh, direct specifically to that question. So uh, th I think that's more of kind of a uh, kind of a more localized um, on, within a county uh, investigation that we have not uh, undertaken. So, but it's an excellent question, and um, um, you know, I'm sure there are, are all sorts of practices of, of using multiple types of plants together to enrich soil. I think the milpa. Uh, agriculture of Latin America is an example of that, and there are, uh, our colleagues in Nebraska are trying to actually bring such practices up there to work with uh, 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 local uh, Latinx uh, uh, immigrants to bring some of these practices up, up right into the Midwest. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, uh, we did include uh, the kind of uh, uh, livestock and plant integration as a as a uh, uh, as, a, as a model or a, a marker of regenerative practices. And uh, our view is, uh, my personal view, is that I think livestock have a, and poultry have an important role to play in terms of providing uh, the kind of uh, enriched uh, uh, and healthy soils. And I think uh, that's some of a lot of the damage has come from conventional or more industrial practices has been that separating out and, uh, and basically uh, uh, re kind of uh, uh, rejecting the notion that uh, nature can often offer a lot of these uh, wonderful so-called ecosystem services uh, and they don't uh, on on largely so-called free although uh, you have to help uh, you know put some money into uh, protecting the local landscapes and to allow nature to offer these uh, services um, but for the most part uh, what agribusiness is about is basically uh, competing and uh, or sees nature as a competition because uh, they want to be able to uh, commoditize everything. So everything from fertilizers to pesticides, uh, which uh, nature can handle on largely on its own, are, are basically uh, uh, monetized in a way that uh, farmers have to buy them uh, what uh, a healthier landscape would uh, provide on its own. Uh, so, you know, it's a great question. Our study doesn't answer this specifically, but we do include uh, livestock crop integration as a marker of regenerative ag. So how, so how also, yeah, oh, go ahead, Anne. Yeah. So if I can also say something, you almost have to look back, you know, beginning 150, 175 years ago, just with the Euro-American uh, concentration of agriculture certainly coming across into the Midwest. I mean, most farms, at that point in time, moving forward until basically, you know, the 1940s or 50s were extremely diversified. There were there was timber to cut for uh, heating your home. Uh, chickens were raised, cattle. I mean, you know, the farmer actually had a diverse landscape that he could actually uh, use to make his farm profitable for him or at least break even. Um, and so the farms were. Uh, diversified. And then, of course, you, you know, things happen after the course of his uh, recent history, World War II, et cetera, and, and the industrial movement of agriculture, and, and it flows into just what, what Rob said. Um, 
the other thing that I want to kind of mention is, and you know, a lot of your colleges and universities, I'll just say Iowa State University, because I'm obviously here in Iowa, um, you know, right now they're experimenting with uh, uh, prairie grasses in between the corn rows and, and uh, measuring uh, out those corn rows with prairie grass plantings, again, for nutrient input into the soil. A lot of other practices are going to be, down, be going on. Iowa, of course, being Iowa, but uh, an agricultural uh, state, but they are seeing more cover crops being utilized on the landscape which is dropping in nutrient into the soil. I can drive from Des Moines to my farm location right on Interstate 80 and, and see, you know, a lot more fields using the cover crops. Um, so that's that's a practice. And, you know, again, I was uh, uh, favored in knowing that Iowa State, uh, you know, was looking at uh, they some of their science field farms um, are using prairie grasses in between the rows and seeing how that might, you know, drop in nutrient into the soil. Well, I, I did notice looking at the the figures and maps that it does seem like there is kind of a disconnect. Would you say that most farmers in the Midwest are doing either animals or crops? Because it, it doesn't seem like, it seems like the people who are integrating these two things are the minority. Uh, Luke wants to answer that question? Well, I just wanted to say that that's a very relevant question for future work and for the other level of this study. But what we were able to look at in this study was much more at the level of the county and whether the county had both of those in in the county and the extent to which that was kind of a, as you might say, a landscape mosaic where there could be some benefits from or harms who knows, from having those uh, those sorts of operations next to each other or perhaps on the same farm, but we just can't differentiate between um, where within the county these different activities do or don't happen in this study. Just it's from the nature of the data that we were using, it's hard to get consistent data for every county in the Midwest. So there's some limits to what you can do. And I wish we were able to answer that question at, with this study. But I'm happy to say that we and others can can answer it perhaps a bit better soon with these uh, other farmer level sorts of uh, and farm level inquiries. Right. So so what Luke brings up is the things that we are, aren't able to capture with the data we have. But I think what's really remarkable about our study is it is what it does capture and that the county level analysis uh, actually encourages a kind of uh, a community wide uh, 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 interventions, uh, you know, uh, you know, we put we saw livestock diversity at the county level and crop diversity at the county level as as being, uh, you know, uh, county measures uh, are as markers of 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 uh, resources. So, for instance, you know, if a county was entirely dedicated to just doing hog production, and the hog economy actually, uh, we don't need to actually see the slide. Um, uh, but this, if, if the hog county actually, you know, if the hog market goes uh, south, as it were, what is that county going to do in terms of bringing revenue in for the local community? So if a county has a lot of livestock diversity and hog goes south, then perhaps um, a cattle or poultry can, can fill in for that and still bring revenue in to have revenue circulate in the county. And same thing with crops. So, um, uh, so, you know, the notion of diversity can be certainly found at the level of the farm. And that, of course, that's a lot of been a lot of focus of uh, a lot of regenerative uh, practitioners. But we want to kind of expand that notion of diversity uh, beyond merely uh, the, the farm gate and into the small area and, and countywide level thing, because we believe that it's when communities start to uh, integrate together in terms of their agricultural practices. It's when the, the real benefits of regenerative ag uh, start to come in. And could you, you all did a great job of listing out in the paper the various regenerative agriculture practices that you were looking at and you you defined them really well and you also listed their benefits and linked to multiple scientific papers that showed the benefits on a lot of different levels 
of these regenerative ag practices. So keeping with this discussion of the integration of crops and livestock, you did you did survey some practices that do integrate crops and livestock. So what were some of those practices and how did they function on a, on a farm? That's a good question. There's so many variables that I have to look that up again. Um, I can prompt you. I, I know yeah, Silvopasture. Help, help. <laughs> I don't paper. Silvo right, I know. What is Silvopasture? Right, right. Um, well, Silvopasture, you know, largely, uh, you know, you can grow uh, crops under under trees. So you can, uh, you know, uh, have trees and, and still be able to grow uh, other crops underneath, or you can... Uh, uh, if you want to do, uh, you can also integrate uh, uh, poultry underneath there. So there are ways and means by which uh, uh, different plants can uh, 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 help each other out in terms of the soil health. And some plants are, some crops are very good at growing uh, under under shade. So um, that that's uh, uh, largely silvopasture. And any other practices that you all want to mention that are that speak to the integration of crops and livestock? Because one thing I noticed is that like, so I think one answer to the question was that we're seeing the um, the row crop farmers use cover crops and, you know, crop diversity and rotations and that sort of thing, like to make their, their crops more diverse. But those same counties where you saw a lot of that happening, you didn't see a lot of of livestock type regenerative agriculture in those counties. So it did it did seem to speak to this the map did seem to show to me that there there was a separation even at the county level between regions that were using that were primarily cropping and regions that were primarily doing animal agriculture and that those things weren't well integrated. And and even you know when you look at the the plains area of the maps versus the forested areas of the map. So it's a forested area up by the Great Lakes. And then when you get further from the Great Lakes on the, the western edge, that's a plains area. And you see lots of intensive grazing over in the plains area, which makes sense. And then you don't see a lot of grazing practices in the areas that are forested. And of course, that just totally makes sense. It's not a, an issue about, well, it's less regenerative because you're not seeing these types of things there. Um, but it, you know, so it's partly just the the ecology of the region, but it is partly about how um, the industry grows up around the, that ecology and then it kind of gets baked in and you're not seeing as much diversity around that. Um, so I have a, like a meta question for you in terms of the data you all have collected based on Solar Tony's um, comment here. And he's saying, we need a coherent, well thought out plan to begin deconsumerism, to eliminate trash in the throwaway society, to transition to an eco-sustainable society, to eliminate fossil fuels, synthetic pesticides and chemicals, GMOs and plastics, to take care of soil, air, water, food, the earth, rivers, oceans, plants, and animals. I think that pretty much covers it in terms of sustainability goals that we might have. So how does your mapping of regenerative agriculture practices tell you where in the Midwest this seems doable, where it might not, and and what sort of policies could be, could we get the biggest bang for our buck in promoting in different areas of the Midwest to, to put us on this path? And is it possible overall? Like, do you see, like, is that just rhetoric or is this like a coherent plan and goal that, that you see as possible in the Midwest? If it's all right, I'll, I'll start first on this. I'll just say that uh, uh, big, I'm I'm all with you, Solar Tony. I, I hear where you're coming from, and it's a, it would be a beautiful thing to arrive in a world where agriculture is treated as a natural economy again. You know where uh, you know that uh, we when we think of agriculture, we think of the soil, we think of water, we think of air, we think of uh, uh, healthy communities, and uh, that is very much the objective of our of our, our organization and our research study. Uh, and, but at the same time, though, we are, uh, you know, largely uh, the Midwest historically has been the um, uh, the source of some of the most in, uh, devastating industrial practices in agriculture that were subsequently uh, exported as a model of production around the world. 
So there's there's the dream and there's the reality of where we are. And then the question is, how do we go from the reality to the to the wonderful dream? Uh, and I, I see that as a new reality of how do we get to a, a way in which agriculture is, is uh, uh, you know, treated as as uh, part and a source of, of human health and well-being. And uh, the fact is, it's a journey and it's a generational journey. And we're and we unfortunately, in many ways, time is running out. The water tables in decline. The, uh, the soils are, are are going to the pot, as it were. And so, how do we um, get out of this? And uh, it's not merely a matter. Some of it is, you know, the logistics of uh, of moving uh, out of one food system into another in such a way that farmers aren't just destroyed economically. So that that's the the reality of it. And then we have to see how do we uh, allow farmers to transition in a way that they can still uh, uh, pay their bills. Um, and how do we do so? And this is a broader question, and this is a question for Regeneration Midwest, is how do we do so in a context in which agribusiness uh, has a very strong, um, uh, is a strong political for force, as much as the pharmaceutical industry or, 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 or weapons industry here in the United States, uh, how do we do that? And that requires or organizing. And so there's hard work to go from the realities of where we are to the, the wonderful uh, dream that Solar Tony uh, provided for us in terms of getting to a place where agriculture is treated uh, much more uh, so-called humanely. And uh, that is the hard work. That is the work that's going to require for us all to uh, roll up our sleeves for the next uh, several decades to, to actually make a dent and move in that direction. Uh, and that is the, you know, requires uh, figuring out a lot of details of logistics of how do we help farmers make the transition? How do we make uh, communities at the county level make this transition? How do we do so in the face of a, uh, of a political system that in essence favors uh, uh, refusing uh, that, that journey? Go ahead, Luke. Well, I don't have a great answer for the large political questions necessarily here, although I think they're extremely urgent. But I will say that just with respect to some of the things you can do with what we've learned. Um, the USDA created something called the farm resource regions, and that's a way of dividing up the country into different agricultural regions that have something similar to, you know, again, like what we did with our little regions. Um, they, they made their own effort. This was a few decades ago, and this kind of work was quite popular actually in the beginning of the 20th century, but there hasn't been a lot of that work done recently. And one um, and something that none of this work has really taken into account would be doing it with an eye towards regenerative agriculture and various sorts of more sustainable transitions for agriculture. So what our work does do is show um, both people interested in, in working in their own region, what other parts of the region, they may be um, more directly working in similar ways with, and then other regions nearby, perhaps, other areas nearby where they could go and establish some connections and engage in a bit of, um, you know, farmer to farmer and community to community, uh, mutual aid, learning, um, and organization. And it kind of gives you just a different sense of the lay of the land different than just what you might get if you looked at a map of the the landforms and the the ecology. So yes, there are these areas that are uh, largely forested at the moment and areas that are in the plains at the moment, but when you look at it from this regenerative agriculture perspective, you see that there's a there's a kind of different story than you might have expected and as such there's new opportunities to make alliances and to learn across difference than there might have been. And, uh, you know, even for states that are charged with uh, in administering some of these policies, some of which you might like, some of which you might want to change, um, you know, some of what they do is via what they can see, right? And so if they see differently and you can help them see differently, uh, you know, some of those policies might change a bit. So, you know, that's a little bit of what I see we can contribute through these maps. Um, just a different point of view than people had been taking when they when they mapped this stuff before, and it's it's not all just the the the, the landform as it was, 
Uh, it's certainly that influences things. History matters, ecology matters, the soil, the geology, they all matter. Uh, but the story is still a bit unwritten, I think. And I think these maps also show that, that, um, that uh, you know, we don't really know where we're going to end up. And we have to kind of um, make that not entirely of our own in a world of our own choosing. But, um, you know, uh, there's there are a lot of possibilities out there, I think, more than I had appreciated, at least. Thanks. OK, and just to keep elaborating uh, and in making that change in vision you know, and looking at things, that's where we also need to broaden the scope and, you know, and look, OK, what are the health impacts? How can we mitigate the impacts of climate change to make a further point to change the route the things are going now to the way we might have some future as opposed to the one where the future might not exist at all? Uh, I think there is plenty of potential for restoration, you no, know, like in the in the sense of an ecological restoration and and to recover and to make things uh, functional as they used to be. And and definitely, I think the the other thing is like being clear that that's probably that that the planet or the Midwest is the place where we are going to stay. That there is no magic trip to Mars or everywhere in the galaxy where we'll find a new place to destroy. You no. Know? Uh, somehow that also needs to get into the vision. And again, this paper is just one of the first stages, but for example, to make the further point, we are looking at impacts on health, no diseases that are related to this kind of uh, production or to these types of agriculture. And also the thing of the response to climate change, you no, know? like how does these things impact on uh, how can we mitigate the negative impacts of climate change? Anne, you want to wrap us up on this topic? I can provoke you a little bit by, by asking you what you think of people like Bill Gates who say, well, we've got all these problems with factory farms. Why don't we just eliminate agriculture for animals and start making our food in a lab um, you know, we could just 3D print our meat. Wouldn't that be better for the environment? I'm I'm familiar, Alexis, with what you're talking about. I've I've not obviously read in depth Bill Gates, but I am familiar about this particular topic. One of the things I have heard um, is that the nutritional value of that particular food isn't quite the quality of what it would be if you worked with a, a healthy soil environment. So it's kind of like you're trading one problem for another. So if people aren't getting healthy food, then you have, you know, disease, you have uh, uh, just a, a number of health issues. Um, and, and it still doesn't accomplish what you're trying to accomplish in the long run. So one of the words I always like to throw into the mix of a conversation is balance. Um, there needs to be a balance, a healthy balance, right and left balance. And this also means, you know, the health of your food, the health of the soil. Um, it's it's not an an easy fix, but I think it's a journey to try to to try to solve the problems. Um, I certainly don't have a word or a sentence that's going to make the world better after we're done with this interview. But I think it's important that everyone take responsibility for doing the right thing. Um, whether you're a consumer, a producer, uh, whatever it might be, um, we live on a tiny planet and it's our responsibility, it's our home and we need to take care of it. And I'm just gonna kind of use that just as general phraseology uh, because I can't use the, the uh, fancy scientific words. <laughs> I'm not good at that, but... Uh, it's our responsibility to take care of the planet. Everyone's. Absolutely. Well, I want to let you go, but I have a couple of burning questions related to current events. And, you know, maybe it's not relevant for what you want to discuss here, but just throwing it out there, the, the H5N1 bird flu and the, you know, the USDA is testing farms via PCR test, if they find H5N1 on a farm, all the birds are culled. So what what regions in the Midwest, like where is in the Midwest, based on your research, 
Um, where is this going to impact? Which counties, which regions in the Midwest are going to be most impacted by this? And if you have any other thoughts about the, the whole situation. I don't mean to steal the show here, but just recently, I would say within the last five to seven days, there was a, like 1.2 million birds in Iowa that they had to kill because of the the Asian in one Asian flu. Um, and then apparently that particular uh, wealthy farm owner, um, after his uh, staff killed all the birds for him, he uh, let them, he fired them. Uh, they had no need to be at the farm because, well, they killed all the birds. So that was a recent story that was just here in Iowa. Uh, I'll just add here that, um, uh, I, well, I wrote a book called Big Farms Make Big Flu. So I, I have a, a certain vantage point about uh, how this is all coming about. And in that book, I described the 2015 outbreak of H5N2 across the Midwest. And uh, other than that more wild birds are being hit this round, it's largely a replay. Uh, this, this outbreak here in 2022, it's largely the industrial uh, poultry that are getting hit worst here in, in Minnesota. It's uh, through uh, Turkey Alley, what I call Turkey Alley, down through the southeastern part of the state. And uh, uh, those counties that have the most uh, industrial turkey are the ones getting hit hardest. I would say that agribusiness does do a lot of uh, efforts to try to blame everyone else but their industrial model. So there's a lot of focus on uh, where H5N1 emerged from, although it's uh, largely uh, in all likelihood from, uh, it came in from uh, Europe, which has been hit, devastated the last uh, five years from uh, H5NX. Uh, and then uh, uh, since spread, uh, there's a really attempt to blame wild birds on, on, on moving, um, uh, the virus from one part of this country to the other. Uh, but as with uh, the 2015, uh, industrial production have, have these long lines of, um, of uh, uh, supply chains and uh, a lot of uh, industrial poultry uh, is concentrated in certain parts of the state over, over others in such a way that uh, uh, one barn gets hit, the entire barn's devastated, and then the virus spreads either through um, uh, moving uh, poultry from one part of the uh, county to the next, or one part of the state to the next, or uh, by uh, the virus uh, floating on particles on the wind from one barn to the other. So we've really uh, reached a point where the viruses are evolving out from underneath uh, the biosecurity models that the industrial production is uh, uh, of, uh, uh, claiming are enough to uh, protect it. And there's no discussion so far about how packing in 15,000 turkey that are all genetically the same may not be the most biosecure way of controlling a virus. And this is the kind of stuff that, uh, in my view, uh, would be better handled by counties that have great uh, biodiversity in terms of its livestock and, in, and its crops in such a way that presents the kind of mosaic landscapes that makes things very difficult for pests and pathogens to solve. And so if we engage in, in just the very regenerative practices that some counties are already doing, and we're more likely to move in a direction of protecting ourselves from the emergence and spread of these deadly pathogens. I, I would love to agree with you, Rob, and I, and I did, I think, until I saw the USDA data where they're testing backyard flocks as well. And they're saying, it's, I mean, they have like 200 something flocks that were industrial and like more than 100 that were backyard flocks. So it doesn't seem like, you know, I, you know, who knows, like the, the test might be extremely sensitive. Um, we don't see, there doesn't seem to be evidence that the bird flu is actually killing the, the poultry. They're just exterminating the poultry based on the positive tests. And there, there might be, you know, other policy issues. Um, but I'm I'm not sure that based on the data we can say for sure that that just you know putting the birds outside means that they won't carry flus. They they might just carry flus. It might be what they do, and it might be that we're having like a kind of an overreaction on on the policymaking side to to something that may have been just ongoing and and might not have the the harm might not be. The flu itself, it might be the policies related to it, but that's just my opinion. Um, and I'd like to move to to Luke and Luis to see if you all have thoughts on 
on what's going on with the bird flu based on what your research tells you about who's going to be impacted and, and where this might go from here? Well, I wish I had uh, thoughts on this yet. I, I, I have been involved with a bit of work about these issues in collaboration with Rob in the past, but uh, we haven't really had much of a chance to look at some of this data, although I would uh, certainly like to do so in the future. I'm sure Rob has, but I, I have I have yet to fully wrap my head around a bunch of these issues. So have been looking at it a little bit recently, yes. Wish I had more. As a dumb question though, like, I mean, obviously Anne told us the story from what happened in Iowa. Is Iowa the only place that's going to be impacted by bird flu or is this gonna impact like other areas in the Midwest? Well, it's just already ha hit a bunch of areas in the Midwest and across the United States. I mean, it's much more in the 2015, it was much more concentrated in the Midwest, but it's actually gone uh, starting from the East Coast, spreading out through the Midwest and beyond. Um, and I would say, I wanna be very clear though, the, the notion that this is some harmless virus that is, is subjected to a, an overreaction is mistaken. This is a highly uh, pathogenic uh, avian influenza, meaning it's a deadly influenza. And uh, one does not want to quibble with a virus that can uh, not only uh, clear out an entire barn of 250,000 layers, but uh, uh, can spread from barn to barn and yes, spill over into backyard flocks. I mean, the, the, here's where 2015 and 2022 differ. What was remarkable about 2015, it was almost entirely concentrated on industrial production. That is not normally the case. You know, you look at H5N1 outbreaks across the world since the turn of the century or any of the um, highly pathogenic avian influenzas, it usually hits an industrial barn and then spreads out into backyard flocks, whereupon the agribusiness then blames the small farmers for the spread of the virus because they didn't pack them in into a biosecure barns. So that's the conflict uh, that was often the case. In this case, uh, this H5N1 is beginning to spread out into uh, local flocks. But if you look at, uh, for instance, the lists of outbreaks here, here in Minnesota, there's been only one or two um, uh, backyard flocks that were hit and almost the entirety of the concentration of outbreaks were in, in the industrial turkeys uh, throughout the southeastern Minnesota. So I, one, I would very much take this seriously. Two, yes, I would very much um, cull the birds that are infected with this, not only because it could spread uh, through the entire uh, supply chain, both industrial production and backyard, but in addition, there's always the risk that this, this is the avian influenza that actually spills over and goes human to human. And I think uh, the last couple of years have told us that we don't want something like that. Um, just to complement a bit what everyone has said, there is the issue, again, the, the big issue here is the disproportionate blaming on the backyard flocks. Because if you read the news or whatever, and I mean, it's always, oh, if the problem is the backyard flocks, we need to eliminate them. But again, here is where the type of research we did, as Luke said, might help to change the way we think about things, no? Because if we, I mean, as some people put the solution on, oh, we should create and have lab-grown meat, not having more animals in the middle, we can also put the counter argument, okay, if for ages what worked was to have backyard birds, how can we do to ensure that that works and keeps working? And actually, how can we engage that type of production, for example, on a diversified system, where if a farmer has uh, his birds infected and they need to be cool, it's not like a total loss, it's not a ruin. He has a different resource upon which he or she can uh, depend and move ahead, no? And, and that's, a, that's a big mentality change we need to you know to have and actually question the ta this type of assertion. So the problem is the backyard folks, like who is saying that, who, who is the thing? And think on the type of research we did showing that, okay, these are actually the things we need to look for how can we do and what kind of research can help us to keep that going and to make it functional? And, and actually, how can, how can we demonstrate that the diverse system actually have the economic benefit, but also has all the other benefits that tend to get ignored when people want just to have a silver bullet or a, a magical solution like, oh, let's grow the meat in a lab on a container, on a fermenter. 
All right, so we've gone over an hour, so I feel that we should wrap up. But if I'll I'll give the floor to each of you to to say um, anything you'd like that maybe didn't get brought up today, or that you think is a, a good topic for future conversations. Let's start with Anne. Well, I. Again, I'd like to wrap up by saying thank you so much for allowing us to present our paper and, and our team. It's uh, you know certainly been a wonderful experience for us to learn uh, as we have for the past two and a half, going on close to three years, actually. Um, so again, we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about our project and our program and, and our discoveries to date. Um, I don't really have anything more to say than what I just previous, previously said. Uh, you know, it is all our responsibility for for taking care of the earth. Um, I've, I've had other scientists actually say, you know, the earth will take care of itself. Uh, not coming out of my mouth, but uh, that was interesting to kind of make a note of. But uh, I think it's our responsibility and, and uh, you know, please don't litter. <laughs> I wanna say that to the public, please don't litter. Um, you know, this is our home, let's keep it clean. So thank you again. Thank you, Anne. How about Luis? Well, I went, uh, what I would like to emphasize or to add is uh, the thing that, again, we were talking today about regenerative agriculture as it's related to food production, what we eat, uh, where does it come from, the, and, and the things. But we actually need also to think on the other implications. No? What's the impacts or what are the associations of these types of, uh, of agriculture, for example, with the health of the people living locally, where it's practitioned? And what are the the climate change implications? No, what are how how a type of agriculture can help us to stop climate change to mitigate the impacts? Naturally, how these things can improve overall health and well-being no, of the people. No, that that's like and and that was that's what will be great also like to see in agencies no like the USDA or whatever or whomever is concerned no. Okay, we want you guys, the researcher, addressing this type of questions. Uh, this will be helpful for us to do what we do. Agreed. And Luke? Well, I suppose this is a bit of a geographer's comment here, but uh, we've spoken a lot of words, but there are a lot of maps and images in what we've done. and. If you want a better sense of what it is we were doing and what it means, please do take a look at that link that we've posted. And um, you might be, you know, many of us are using maps these days to figure out where we're going on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think this, uh, some of these maps are also useful in figuring out where we're going more collectively and um, what sorts of, as I said before, what sorts of alliances we might not have thought of that we can, um, make to uh, move forward into that future together. So I don't know how much looking at maps really helps you get there, but um, hey, uh, some of them look pretty, I think. So, you know, take take a look. Don't just listen to us, Yak. Thanks. And Rob, I won't pigeonhole you here. You can talk about anything you like, but it did one last question that I wanted to pick up from the chat was, um, you know, this is Regeneration Midwest, the Midwest Healthy Ag Project, and someone asked, well, what about California? So Rob, in your closing statements, please also include um, a little bit about how um, Midwest Healthy Ag got started in terms of what other people could do. Cause this was really a farmer generated project. The farmers got together, they saw these research needs. They, you know, you all ended up applying for grants. Could that be done in other parts of the country? And I just would like to make a pitch for this. Maybe I'm I'm answering the question myself. I apologize, but Regeneration International really does want to use Regeneration Midwest and the Midwest Healthy Ag Project as an example of what one region did, and encourage other regions to to do similar things to to get the people power together and then get scientific, get the the evidence that you need to support your policy position. So now you get the last word, Rob. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Alexis, and and thanks to Corey for all both of you for hosting us today. It's been a, a wonderful time, and these kind of conversations are 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 really lovely and necessary. So and and uh, we hope to have some more in the future. And and this is very much 
uh, you know, the end, as Anne brought up, this is the end of our phase one of, in terms of our analysis. And as uh, Luis brought up, we're moving toward a phase two with connecting these kind of agricultural production and where things are happening to the kind of climate change impacts and, and uh, population uh, health impacts that we were, uh, we want to see the, the uh, uh, and uh, a map out and, 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 and uh, explore. Uh, but it's exactly the what I was going to end up here, uh, Alexis. I was going to uh, point out that very much that uh, this is not uh, just a bunch of eggheads like myself, you know, you know, doing this analysis, right? This is very much a, a farmer-initiated project, and farmers and and uh, food uh, activists have been involved in the project right from the start. Uh, the variables that we choose for the index was a, com a, a com ongoing conversation of many weeks. Uh, among uh, people from different backgrounds, different expertise, uh, to uh, converge and think on uh, uh, how we might map this out, and um, uh, in and I, I, I assure you, it's uh, it certainly changed my notion of what science can be. Uh, it's not just uh, out of the kind of R1 uh, research-heavy universities. Uh, a lot of good work's being done there, but this is a more of a science for the people, and this is very much uh, in the direction of. Uh, uh, the people most affected by uh, uh, the impacts of, um, of decisions about farming, uh, taking the banner and just saying, hey, this is the direction we want to go in, in terms of making decisions about uh, how to figure out what to do with our communities. And uh, I think it's been an enormously uh, productive and, and, and enlightening and illuminating and, and delightful experience for all of us uh, to work together in ways that we haven't worked before. So, uh, and, but it takes a lot of practice too for people from with different languages and expertise to get together and, and sit around a table and week after week for years on end, uh, work through a lot of this and it's hard work, but uh, for us, we find it, uh, it's been very helpful and we hope it's been very helpful for you and to take up Luke's invitation to look through these maps and think through. Uh, again, it's not the final word. It's very much the starting of a conversation for what is a generational project, which is to move the Midwest into a direction of, of much better agricultural production, much better for people, for the land, for wild animals, for our water, uh, for uh, the health and well-being of local communities. And yeah, this most definitely can be done elsewhere uh, throughout the country. I mean, there's efforts in the Southwest to start this kind of work. Uh, California, I think uh, on uh, there were posted uh, in the comments uh, uh, links to a couple papers or uh, titles of a couple papers of work uh, that has done more national level kind of work that you can start with. But you know, our notion, let a thousand flowers bloom, let uh, people from across the country come together and think through what's best for the community. What works for as gener uh, regenerative ag here in the Midwest may not uh, count as regenerative ag elsewhere. So let's take the geographer's lead on this and think through that different places have different needs and different definitions and work your way through what's best for your community. And uh, we entirely uh, are 100% uh, behind Regeneration International's efforts to uh, use this project as an example and, and a source of inspiration for all of us, both here in the United States and abroad and the rest of the world, uh, to bring about an agriculture that can um, uh, continue to feed people for many generations and in a way that uh, provides nutritious food and uh, all sorts of lovely bounties that uh, make life worth living. So uh, I think uh, our, you know our project is only a little stepping stone for this, and there's a lot of work being done out there, and uh, we're just happy to be able to uh, contribute in that direction. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, everybody, who shared this time with us. And we will definitely bring the Midwest Healthy Ag team back. This is the second conversation we've had with you all, and we're going to do it again. Um, I look forward to seeing what you all do next. Thanks for everything.